So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to warmly welcome you this to this webinar on responsible business in conflict affected or high risk areas. I'm Alice harbach forel I head the programs at the UN Global Compact Network Switzerland and Liechtenstein. The objective of our network, if you could just show the next slide, please, is to draw the attention of companies to the relevance of social and environmental issues for the activities and to support our members in the implementation of responsible business practices through trainings, peer exchange and other learning formats. Today's webinar is co-organized in collaboration with Swiss Peace and Focus Rights. It takes place in cooperation with the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs as part of Measure 3, the promotion of the UN guiding principles of the Swiss National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. Today, we are very happy to welcome highly knowledgeable and uh, with a lot of expertise speakers. Um, first of all, we will have Frédéric Schenner. He is the Senior Advisor on Business and Human Rights at the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. He will be followed by um, Regula Meng and uh, Evelyn Ditsche, um, speaking on responsible business in conflict affected and high risk areas. We will have then time for a Q&A, so please um, write your questions, uh, keep your questions and, until, until this time. We will then have Charlie Main, uh, CEO at VSC Security Solutions, uh, talking about responsible security in complex environments. And we will end with an expert interview of Jamie Williamson, uh, Executive Director of ICOCA. So uh, I would like to thank all of you, all the speakers for, for the engagement. And before I hand over to Frederic, I just would like to show you our housekeeping rules so that you know the session is recorded. Slides and recording will be made available after the webinar. So we will send them to you by email. Um, it would be great if you could write your questions in the chat so that we, we can take them during the Q&A. And of course, um, if you need to speak, then uh, unmute, but otherwise, please remain muted uh, during the whole webinar. Would be great as well if you could activate your video um, before speaking. So now I'm very happy to hand over to Frédéric Schenner. Um, and uh, yes, Frédéric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, dear participants, I really would like to warmly thank you for attending this important webinar. Some of you uh, do business in high risk or, or conflict areas. This means that you take risks regarding your own investments, but also it means uh, that you can have an impact on your environment, for example, on the communities or on the people that live close to your operation. And this impact can be positive, but it can as well be negative. Therefore, I mean, your presence is important today, and I hope that the different tools you will be introduced to will help you to conducting effective risk assessments, as well as an appropriate human rights due diligence. To begin with, um, you all know that the UN guiding principle on business and human rights are the recognized international framework that define responsibilities when it comes to human rights and business activities. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because I assume that you already knew the three pillars of the UN guiding principle. First pillar is um, that states should protect human rights. Second pillar is that businesses should respect human rights, which means no harm. And the third pillar is for governments uh, and enterprises, and it means to find uh, remedies to human rights breaches. So UNDPs, uh, they also outline uh, that risks can be exacerbated in complex or conflict-affected contexts. And that's where this notion of heightened due diligence comes into consideration, as uh, you will see later today in this webinar. 
When it comes to Switzerland, we have a national action plan that you mentioned, Alice, before on business and human rights, which translates actually our obligation to protect human rights in the framework of business activities. And uh, this uh, national action plan has 35 specific measures that cover the time frame 2020-2023, which means that we are now actually working on an updated uh, national action plan. Our national action plan, it is also a communication instrument towards external partners. And it clearly states that Switzerland expects all companies that they respect human rights throughout their supply chain, uh, which means in Switzerland, but as well abroad. One of the measures uh, of our national action plan is also to provide guidance to companies that operate in conflict or high-risk areas, and that's why we are actually all here together. If we look at the UN level, we have as well a specific working group on business and human rights, which is in charge, among several other tasks, uh, to developing uh, guidance uh, for companies. The UN working group has issued clear recommendations that business act businesses active in conflict areas should apply conflict-sensitive heightened human rights due diligence, and it has also asked states to develop and disseminate adequate guidances. That's why uh, states as well, together with UNDP, that was, I think, last year, has uh, issued a specific guidance uh, on how to conduct risk assessments and conduct human rights due diligence in fragile contexts. So on one hand, uh, there are a lot of uh, guidances which have been produced, a lot of yeah, guides, uh, different books that tell how companies should uh, act in fragile areas. It's on one hand, but on the other hand, it's a lot of legislation uh, that companies have to face. I mean, you probably know that uh, last Thursday, the EU Parliament has voted a new uh, legislation on human rights due diligence. Now the details of this legislation are being negotiated and there are a lot of groups at press to introduce uh, the concept of heightened due diligence in fragile contexts. So this means that the topic of our webinar today is really actual and will become more and more important. I also understand uh, that it can be difficult for companies to know what to do. And in this sense, it is important for governments to ensure that regulation are aligned with the UN guiding principle, and as well that all different instruments, uh, guidances that are being offered can be used to facilitate the implementation of this, uh, these legal obligations which are coming into force in more and more jurisdiction. So it's very important for us governments to make sure that there is coordination between different actions and that all uh, tools produced can be used um, in an efficient way. Usually, Foreign investors, when they looked at business and human rights, uh, they do it, I would say, more often in the perspective of risk management. How can I mitigate risk in an effective and efficient manner in order to protect my investment, my staff, my equipment, and equally, if not more important, my reputation that we see very often, I mean, companies, and it's perfectly legitimate. We, uh, as government, we have to be aware of this and we have to engage with businesses and provide the adequate platform to exchange ideas. That's as well something we can do as a convening power and leaders and uh, propose adequate guidances. So before Concluding, I just would like to give you two uh, short examples of works that have been done uh, by the Swiss government. Um, one is all the work we've, do, we've been doing with commodity trading companies who have been issuing uh, through a multi-stakeholder group 
uh, guidance on how to implement the UN guiding principle uh, for commodity traders. You can go on our website or quickly as well flash this one and you will find this guidance. It talks about conflict areas, sensitive areas, and it talks as well about the International Code of Conduct of, uh, Association, which uh, is an association that monitors the implementation of an international code of conduct for private security providers. I'm telling this today because when we look at uh, companies that work in fragile contexts, they very often use private security providers at different levels and in different aspects of their supply chain. And we believe that this is very important to take into consideration uh, when risk uh, assessments are made. And that's why I'm as well especially happy that we have today Charlie Main from VSC Security who can come with very concrete examples regarding uh, private security. And as well, Jamie Williamson will explain you about the code and its association. So I would like to wish you fruitful discussion, um, interesting time, and I will be staying with you to answer possible questions when uh, this will be the moment to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frederic. Thank you for these introductory words and the perspective of the Swiss government. Um, now I will uh, invite regular men and Evelyn Dice to speak about responsible business in conflict and high risks areas and what companies uh, can or need to do to act responsibly in these contexts. So regular, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alice, and also welcome, a warm welcome from my side. It's great to see so many people interested in these very relevant topics. So over the next half an hour, um, together with Evelyn uh, Dieter from Swiss Peace, we'll give you kind of a, an overview of some of key points, key consideration of what it means to do business responsibly um, in conflict affected and high risk areas. And I would like to start with the question of which kind of company should even worry or, or consider this topic? Because um, as we have heard, basically the, the expectations of companies to respect human rights, including of course in, co in contexts that are affected by conflicts or that have a higher risk level, um, they, these are based on the UN guiding principles on business and, and human rights. And based on uh, the UN guiding principles, basically um, companies can be involved with these complex areas in three, at least three different ways. So they can either cause uh, negative impacts directly through their own activities, uh, because for example, they have a uh, own facility in place in this area. Maybe they can also contribute to negative impacts together with others. So for example, because they have a, a supplier or maybe a, another entity that they're collaborating with in this area, but they all can also be linked to, uh, to the operations or the negative impacts. They can be linked to the operations, products or services by their business relationships. Um, and what's important here is to really have that value chain perspective of, of how a company could potentially be involved with these issues and in line with the UN guiding principles, uh, consider all internationally recognized human rights along the full value chain. And um, I'm going to give a couple of examples to kind of make it a bit more tangible. So, for example, if we think at really at the beginning of the value chain, this could relate to a company that kind of sources some kind of materials, maybe raw materials, other materials from a conflict affected areas. Of course, the conflict minerals is here always the, the, the example that everybody knows could be, for example, gold. But it could also be other kind of materials, such as, for example, if a company uses in its product uses lithium batteries and that these lithium batteries, they have cobalt in it. Um, so it's very likely that the cobalt is coming, for example, from the DRC, which could be a, considered a context that has a higher risk for certain human rights abuses uh, to occur. So here, really, we need to think broad and, 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 and kind of think which materials come from areas that might be higher risk or conflict affected. Then, of course, uh, can be related to uh, maybe a bit more direct in the value chain. So maybe it's a direct supplier, maybe it's the indirect supplier. 
uh, that is based in these areas. So for example, might be a textile supplier in a country that has um, a military regime that is uh, known for certain human rights abuses and where the risk uh, accordingly could also be uh, then higher. It could be connected to some kind of investment that the company is doing uh, in such areas. So for example, the company can uh, support some kind of financial transactions uh, that involve actors from these areas. Maybe the company contributes funds to an activity uh, in the high risk area. So all of these financial transa transactions, they can also be part of how a company can be connected. Then of course, if the company has own facilities, uh, including joint ventures in these areas, but also when the company has clients. So when it uh, sells products, sells services to clients that operate in the, those areas. So for example, the sales of machine to an extractives company that operates uh, in an area where maybe uh, non-state armed groups are present. And then finally, at the very end of the value chain, it could be related to the disposal of waste or unused goods in these areas and where what happens with this waste might, for example, be linked to some kind of illegal activities. So here, the really key point is that uh, this topic is not just relevant for companies that have own operations in these areas, but thinking of this value chain perspective and thinking of how companies could be linked to these issue from in uh, the, along different activities along their value chain. Um, this is really what we want to look at. To give you a couple of more examples, um, when we read the news, we see and we know that the topic of doing responsible business or doing business in high risk or conflict affected areas is very present. And it is relevant for companies that are, that are part of all different types of sectors and geographies. So for example, um, I'm just picking up a few. If you want to read up more, uh, you'll get the slides with all the links. But for example, uh, the case of Lafarge in Syria is very well known. Um, and uh, Lafarge admitted that the Syrian subsidiary paid an armed group, so the AIS, to help protect its staff at the cement plant they still had operating after the conflict broke out. For example, the oil company Exxon was also in the media. They were accused of complicity in human rights abuses uh, that were committed by public security forces in Indonesia. Uh, and what they were uh, allegedly doing is providing facilities and machines to the military, so to public uh, uh, public security, which allegedly then tortured and killed uh, local community members. Then, of course, a very um, timely debate or, or very debate that's very relevant at the moment around which type of business activities can still be leg legitimately conducted in Russia or which products can still be sold after its invasion of Ukraine. So for example, uh, here uh, an article about the continued sales of food products by Nestle in Russia. And another example from the IT industry where social media platforms such as Facebook were uh, allegedly used by security forces, in, in this case, the, gov uh, the, the military, to silence people who were criticizing the government. This is really just to give you a bit of a flavor of what are the type of issue that might arise and, and in what different ways may companies be uh, involved with it. And I think it's clear from a human rights perspective, uh, it's really important to have this on the radar and to have a closer look. So it's important from a human rights perspective. Um, I'm convinced it's also important from a business perspective. Uh, we've heard before uh, Frederick in his introduction, he kind of gave already a bit of an overview of what the different stakeholder expectations, what the legal requirements are. And, and in case some of you at some point will have to go back maybe to your superiors, to your colleagues um, in the company and kind of make a case and argue uh, um, of why your company should look at this. I want to give you a little bit, uh, you can use this slide, you're welcome to. Uh, I want to give you a little bit, you know, of, a, of more of arguments that, that may, might help you to convince uh, your, your peers or your, your boss, um, uh, because I expect you're already convinced if you're here. So basically, um, motivations that we observe, why company focus on these issues that really uh, the basis of, of what a lot of companies also do is also rooted in the values and principles that the company have adopted. So they have adopted commitments to certain values, to certain ethical standards. And so there is also this intrinsic motivation to fulfill these values in practice. 
Then, of course, at the left side on this slide, we have a long list of different stakeholder expectations. So this includes the expectations of the business partners, of your business clients, of your uh, end customer, of investors, of employees, um, and so on, that are all expecting companies to implement uh, respect for human rights or to respect uh, human rights, including or especially also when they operate uh, in complex environments. And what we see more and more is that also kind of the legal obligations that are arising are passed on through the value chain. So you might have a business customer that is covered by a regulation and then as, as they need to do due diligence, they will start asking the other companies more and more questions. So this is something that, that we are expected to see a lot more uh, in the future. And of course, the reason for this is uh, in the increasing legal requirements. We have uh, heard uh, from it already. I think here a really interesting point is what Fredrik mentioned about developments in the European Union. So it's not just about conflict minerals, it's also about uh, or the proposal, at least, that it's, it's discussed at the moment makes explicit reference to, uh, in the text of the European Parliament. It makes an explicit reference to um, the topic of heightened due diligence um, and that companies should conduct uh, uh, business in a conflict sensitive way uh, when they operate or when they are somehow involved with conflicts affected in high risk areas. Of course, um, not not kind of complying with this or 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 not doing responsible business in these areas can affect reputation as we have seen at the different uh, newspaper articles that the topic is on the radar. It can of course negatively affect client relationships, maybe even sales, and it can lead to very costly and lengthy legal claims and legal disputes that of course in turn will affect reputation and client relationships. So I think all these are good reasons to have a closer look at the topic. And with this, I would like to hand over to Evelyn Dietze from Swiss Peace, who will explain a bit more in depth uh, what a conflict affected area is and how companies are expected to do business in connection to these areas. Thank you very much, Regula. And uh, also a well, uh, warm welcome from me to everybody who's joined online. I'm very pleased to see so many of you. What I will do in the next four slides is delve into four further questions that are also covered in the questions and answers um, uh, publication to which this relates, and to give some further examples of, of, uh, um, of what, the, what is meant with the, with the various um, uh, recommended, with the, with the um, the heightened human rights due diligence and, and the sorts of contexts and situations that, that this relates to. So for the first slide, I would like to make three points. Um, important to remember is there is no definite list of conflict affected and or high risk areas. Um, and there is, of course, conflict affected and high risk and fragile that are not necessarily um, the same. And this is, there can be no such list because the uh, it, situations are dynamic and evolve. There are a number of um, guidances and indicators that have been compiled in the context also of the legal requirements. For example, there is the CAHRA list that relates to the EU regulations of conflict minerals. The OEC has, OECD has a publication on states of fragility that gives a list of about 60 countries considered fragile. And there is the RUAC listing, uh, which is, a, is on rule of law in armed conflict situations where uh, um, it highlights what situations are considered armed conflicts. Now, what this means for a company is that you cannot go by a list, but it's really a case by case assessment. And if in doubt, it would mean that you should rather consider conducting a heightened human right due diligence, as opposed to saying, well, the context where I'm working is not on a list, therefore it should be fine. What there is, of course, is that there is an indicative list where there is indicative characteristics and signs by which you can go to assess what your case uh, situation might be. So if there are issues around public security, uh, compromises there where there's obvious conflicts and mass violence to secure, that's a pretty clear case that this is, you're dealing with a conflict affected uh, context. Situations where human rights violations are endemic and they may particularly involve certain groups within a society 
or where mass atrocities are taking place or where there are legacy issues around that, those are also signs that to look, to, you know, that indicate that more than just normal human rights due diligence would be required. Where the rule of law is ineffective or non-existent or where laws apply to certain constituencies, but others are sort of much more vulnerable and it's more selective whether legal uh, frameworks and regulations are really applied to them, yet another sign. Um, movements of people such as internally displaced persons or refugee movements can also be an indicator for, for um, uh, uh, conflict affected and high risk areas. Um, fragility and legacy of past conflicts really relates more to high risk areas and fragile contexts where there may not be a direct conflict, there may not be an active conflict there, but there is certainly a heightened risk that conflicts could break out again, particularly if the dynamics of how economic activities are conducted are aggravating grievances uh, that linger underneath uh, a, a situation which, which you know, is not a, a, an active conflict. And then I think a, an issue for the future is the impact of climate change and other environmental factors that increase the competition around natural resources, particularly around land and water, where uh, we might see more conflicts arising in the future. And so those are signs, you know, those would be sort of in the to look out for a, a heightened risk uh, um, uh, situations. And I think this also pertains to particular sectors more than to others. For example, any land-based activity or water-based activity, you know, where water is used uh, and water stress might occur, um, uh, definitely give you some, some red flags on that. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Now, where does heightened human rights due diligence uh, differ from the basic human rights process? Um, one part has already been mentioned. There is legal and regulatory requirements that ask specifically for human rights due diligence to be conducted, and they emphasize that in certain uh, contexts I mean, and in relation to certain types of uh, uh, materials or, or, or um, uh, produce and services, uh, this may be required. And so there's a sort of legal part. But another argument is that if there is a conflict situation or a tense situation where risks, where the risks are higher and there are legacy issues that conflicts could, could again break out and, and tensions um, intensify, in those situations, companies need to be aware that they're not a neutral actor. They impact the incentives and the power structures um, that underlie uh, just the economic, social, and, and uh, political relationships, and how they comport themselves, how they conduct their business can influence conflict dynamics in direct ways or indirect ways, but also in positive ways or negative ways. Um, and so there needs to be a heightened awareness then that in such situations, how the company conducts its business affects the, 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 um, the, 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 the tension and the conflict situation. So those are the reasons why for those specific contexts, a heightened human rights due diligence going beyond the basic of assessing whether a corporate uh, uh, um, or a business is exposed to human rights risks to really go what its impact on the dynamics of a conflict is, uh, both direct, indirectly and, and, and directly. So that requires that more emphasis put, is put on the risk assessment and the measures you put in place and how you embed them in, the, in your systems. And so it's front loading somewhat the basic human rights uh, due, diligence, due diligence process with, with this additional analysis and also uh, a conflict sensitivity be to be applied in that analysis um, um, for, the, for the human rights due diligence process. Now, what and how can a comprehensive risk analysis look like? Excuse me? Okay. Um, I think that wasn't for me. Anyway, so the comprehensive risk assessment is to, to look at the dynamics between the business and its stakeholders and also the context as opposed, as opposed to only assessing the exposure of the business to human rights risks. So that means to integrate an analysis of the conflict lines and the conflict drivers and triggers into the human rights risk analysis and then to pursue a conflict sensitive approach to how you conduct business and business relationships. And I'll explain that uh, just in the next slide also. Um, and then there is this issue also about if if you're in a conflict situation, um, the business there is a risk for the business to violate international human rights law, and this can pertain to individuals or staff and, 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 and managers within companies. So that's a very particular sort of 
of risk that needs specialist expertise to look at if you're really in a in a in a in an area where where uh, an active conflict takes place so can we go to the next slide thank you um so how can you take this conflict sensitive approach well conflict sensitivity itself means that you look at the root causes and drivers and triggers of a conflict uh, or an ongoing or a latent conflict situation and instability that exists and then look at the interaction of factors uh, of these factors with business operations and relationships so let me make some examples one example would be the revenue you pay um, to uh, uh, um, authorities, and this may be at different levels, how may they, you know, ref uh, uh, be, be uh, affecting the conflict, how the conflict is conduct conducted and how the power, how it shapes the power relationships. Um, so in the analysis of prevailing conflicts and tensions and possible legacies, you could look at, you know, if there are particular socioeconomic uh, fault lines within this context, whether there is a particular pattern to who owns assets and who doesn't, whether there are particular vulnerable groups whose livelihoods may depend on uh, access to natural resources without them having formal rights to these um, versus uh, national governments giving out concessions and, and, and uh, 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 con uh, concluding contracts and agreements that ignore these sorts of situations, and particularly if there's legacies uh, involved where perhaps there was a civil war around these sorts of issues in the past, this sort of thing should, should come out in the analysis um, uh, of, of the conflict um, conflict analysis in the heightened human rights due diligence. And then it's also about assessing stakeholders, who's, who's uh, about to gain from a presence of a business operations and who may lose. So again, the example, for example, with uh, land access, you know, if a land concession is given out, let's say to build a massive solar plant, there is the question who uses this land now, maybe only on a seasonal basis, maybe there is some cultural heritage associated with this. And these sorts of uh, attentions can give rise to uh, uh, conflict situations further down the line if there is not uh, an engagement or a, uh, a clarification also about current land use versus planned use, land use. So that would be an example of assessing, assessing stakeholders. Another issue would there be if an economy is such that it is very kind of clearly geared to a very limited group, let's say a political and economic elite that has actually access, formal access and drives the formal economy and a large part of this, uh, the population in the informal economy that has, so there is a, you know, a, 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 a very strong um, power imbalance. This would also should also come out in a, in, a, in a stakeholder assessment and it could well relate then who represents whom at which level of government or at which level of authority. For example, often you might have a conflict between who are local authorities and traditional authorities and their, uh, you know, who they think is responsible for land allocation. And then the next step would be to evaluate whether trade-offs increase or decrease the risk of conflict and human rights violations. Now, this, of course, from a purely business perspective, you could well assess this in the sense of what's the risk to the business. But what is asked in, human, in heightened human rights due diligence and under the UNGPs is that you don't only think about the, conflict, the risk to the business, but the risk to the people who are involved. And so that goes beyond assessing, well, you know, maybe the affected groups are too weak to protest, so therefore we are fine no actually from a human rights perspective it's the, the the risks to the people that their livelihoods gets destroyed or that they um you know get have to move on or can't use land for seasonal uh, um, purposes and things like that so really that requires thinking about those dynamics and then the last point is to act upon this understanding you gain from from taking a conflict sensitivity approach to your assessment and to minimize any direct or indirect impacts of the business on these conflict triggers and triggers. And in some cases, it might well mean that the, the operating environment is too difficult to do so, or that the mitigation measures could be quite expensive and quite elaborate, more than you would usually assume under, a, uh, under your environmental or social uh, uh, performance work and, and the basic human rights due diligence process. Um, so, as I said, some of the issues that are particularly critical and have where you can find ample of examples, and it would be a good source also to look for if you're new to a context is whether there have been issues about land access, land disputes, access to water and other natural resources. And, 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 and another point would be uh, the labor relationships, you know, who is employed to, to do what sort of work and are there sort of socioeconomic dynamics 
of a ne negative kind underpinning um, in, in particular contexts. And what I should also say is on these lists that exist on, you know, for fragile countries and for high risk contexts, there are sometimes countries where it only pertains to a certain area within a country and it can be very particular to a legacy issue or a certain group such as indigenous people, where you wouldn't, if you look only at the whole country, think that there is a high risk uh, um, or a lingering conflict situation. So you, you know, going by lists or, or looking only at the country wouldn't give you enough information than actually drilling down in this particular area of a country where that may well be, where there may well be issues that, you know, particularly in a large country or a differentiated country where, you know, different sorts of uh, socioeconomic groups reside throughout uh, would not necessarily be on your radar screen immediately. And then a very, that for the last slide, a quite a difficult question, but of course it has come up very much so in the context of the, um, uh, the situation in the, in the Ukraine is what consideration should inform the decision that the company takes on whether it should stay or exit a conflict affected area. And again, very much in the, like in the identification of such uh, areas, it's a case by case matter. And what matters here in particular, what's important is the, the deliberation and the explanation that the company gives for either decision, whether to stay or to, or to leave and to make that open and in a way also subject, you know, open to criticism, but also to be able to, to have a well-founded uh, uh, um, uh, stance why you may have decided in one way or another. And some of the questions to ask in this in, in, in such a situation is, is, for example, how would leaving impact or harm your employees and your customers? How might they be affected? Does that give you a reason to, to stay or does that give you a reason to say, well, you know, actually, they're, they're, you know, this is a manageable, there, there is not much of a the issue there, this is a managed situation. Um, and then, so for example, the case of, you know, the provision of essential goods and services, what is an essential good and services? Re service relates also to, you know, who else can supply the same thing? Is it, a, is it something that's related to uh, uh, medical conditions or something like that, whether a, a replacement is not found or is only part of the, 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 um, the, the, the spectrum of, of goods and services that a company uh, provides in this spectrum of, of, you know, should stay and others are, and, and other parts are to leave. Um, so there is a differentiated assessment to be made on that. Another question is, could the goods and services or particularly also the revenue payments that the business make, can they be used to benefit one part? Will they, use, you know, will they benefit one party over the other? Could these goods and services that you supply be weaponized? So that's a question that... Um, um, Regular was mentioning for before, for example, in the digital world, in digital information systems, uh, they can be used for good purposes, but they can also be used to, to trace people, to go after people and those sorts of things. So those sorts of considerations come in here. Um, could they provide a strategic advantage is another question, and could they be used to oppress? So um, um, I guess there is also a, lot, a range of scenarios that you can think about and to assess uh, the risks that your goods and services or uh, um, may provide, you know, for what they could be used in in such a context, and and um, uh, where the revenue and the relative scale of the revenue that you you pay, and and, and what that would, could do to the conflict dynamics. Um, and um, the last point is that you know, goods and services do they contribute to the fulfillment of local populations human rights so those could be reasons why to stay if you're providing something that is really vital to the local population for which there is no alternative um, this could be things that are falling in the medical sphere or 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 basic food stuff and things like that. But the question is always, uh, is it really dependent on your supply or is there other suppliers and how many other suppliers? And, and you know, is there a selection bias as to who would be served if you were to leave and those sorts of questions. So in a way, um, uh, I guess the best advice is you, it's really to question and to go after these sorts of question when you're assessing a context rather than looking for some sort of a list where you can tick off and say, yes, I have to do heightened human uh, rights due diligence or not. And in, in, in case of doubt, rather to go for it um, and, and look more deeply and then to exclude that, you know, how 
basically to evaluate how severe the situation is uh, and, and the sorts of uh, products and, uh, uh, and services that you're supplying and the relationship, the relative scale of your relation, of your importance in the country in, in, in relation to the national economy. So that, for example, would be very different in the extractive industries. If, if a country is very resource dependent and, and uh, relies on those revenues, you have a much, you know, it's a different question than if it's one of several taxpayers where it's a small part and it won't make a difference in the conflict situation. Um, of course, there are, you know, case public case, there's a lot of public material, don't always have to go and, and, and uh, source privately and, and immediately, I mean, a lot of the upfront assessment and the first scoping can be done looking at, at whether there are such cases, for example, in the accountability mechanisms of international development banks and stuff, you, it would give you a good handle whether in a certain country there are issues or not that others have already faced and therefore you should also uh, be looking out for. That applies in particular also for countries that are maybe not top of the list of what you would consider a, a, um, a, a conflict affected and high risk or fragile context. Thank you very much. With that, I hand back to whoever comes next. To me. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Evelyn. Um, th that was a lot of uh, flesh to the bone. Um, maybe to wrap up um, in a couple of words, just kind of more theoretical uh, part at the beginning. So what are some key action points that company that we recommend companies to consider or, or to do um, to kind of evaluate this question of, of doing business in uh, conflict affected and high risk areas? And the first one is to really have a good monitoring system in place to identify and monitor um, what the situation is, if it is a conflict affected or high risk areas, and especially also how and when conflict dynamics or the risk level changes, because as we heard, this is very, very context dependent and of course dynamic. Then the second point is to consider international uh, humanitarian law, uh, understand when it's apl applicable in a given context and, and what, it's mean, what it means for the company's rights and obligation under international humanitarian law. Then of course, uh, what we heard before about conducting heightened due diligence. So to really have a closer look at the risk that might arise in these areas, conduct uh, conflict sensitivity uh, analyze, uh, analyzes. So to really have a look at how do the company's operations and business relationship influence conflict dynamics and then take actions based on this understanding of course, it's also a question of having the necessary responsibility assigned at the different levels of the organization. So if something happens or if you see the risk level uh, is changing, the company is able to react pretty fast. And also that the necessary resources are in place to kind of deliver on this whole process of heightened due diligence. And the last point uh, is really important point, um, and it's a transversal point that's uh, stakeholder engagement is key to this process. So it's really also about identifying who are the internal, who are the external stakeholders, which expertise um, is needed internally, externally to do this heightened due diligence and especially also at local level to kind of include also local stakeholders who will be the stakeholders that are most knowledgeable uh, about their context, about their the, what's going on and, and how maybe the company influences in local dynamics So really make sure to, to have these on the radar and to involve them actively. And as uh, Evelyn briefly mentioned before, um, in case you want to know more about this topic, um, we developed a new Q&A for companies together with uh, Swiss Peace uh, and from, from our side, from Focusrite, in the context um, of the Swiss National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights. You can download it now on the website of the Swiss National Action Plan. And there will also be, so this is the English version, which is ready for download. And there will also be versions in French, German, and Italian that will be available soon and for you to download. And now I think we have a couple of minutes for a question. Um, first from, from Francesca Ferreriti, and she's asking, uh, Evelyn, I think that's a question for you. Uh, regarding the indicative uh, characteristics of risk areas, um, if there is an index or sources to use to quantify or to make these science objectives in the company's analysis. 
Yes, I think that is a good question, and I would recommend to go about that way in first looking what indices are there, but you'd have to drill a little bit deeper than just the, the ones I mentioned before, and I can give you some examples on that. And then you already get a feel where the issues are, and then to drill, drill deeper with more quantitative, uh, qualitative sources um, and uh, to, to uh, find, find out more about legacies and situations and, and who managed monitor situations. So for example, on the human rights situation, there will be regular reports published by the UN and others that, uh, that cover this subject. And you can basically Google a country and an area for, for uh, such reports and for anything flagged. I mean, there's websites that collect cases on business and human rights in particular, the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, there's two or three organizations that selectively look for cases, so they give you some idea uh, in terms of how, uh, how what's been flagged already. Um, I mentioned on fragility, the OECD every set two years publishes a list um, of fragile states of fragility where they look at six or seven, uh, I think six dimensions of fragility where you can actually go into the detail why they think those countries are fragile. And, and you know, this may more or less relate to, so, to your business activities. You can, you can assess that by drilling into the details of, of the country or the, the context you're concerned about. There's another index on fragility Fragility. I forgot the organization now, but has also done this quite for, for some time. There is a database on internally displaced people and refugees, an observatory that tracks that, um, uh, that you can identify. Um, yes, on and, and rule of law, of course, there's, for example, the World Bank governance indicators that assess various dimensions of, of the public sector and of, of the, you know, the, the quality of governance where um, developments over, I think, since the late 90s or so have been, been tracked, and that's a source to look at for, for, those, uh, for, for those sorts of dimensions. Um, then there are more qualitative um, reports, such as the Bertelmann, Dex, Bertel, Bertelmann Foundation's Transformation Index on particular countries that give an update of the situation in a country every two years. That will give you quite some detailed information. And of course, the purchable resources such as from the uh, Economist Intelligence Units and others that, that um, you know, which usually would be available within a company's political risk assessment uh, anyway, I mean, obviously, depending on the size of the company and your, how often you have to do this sort of assessment for, for, for different for different locations where you're active or operating in, but those uh, commercial um, um, sources are also available. Um, I guess for corporate people, it's sometimes not you know these sort of databases and indices are perhaps not that well known, but um, I mean it's not rocket science to look for them and and, and get the first feel and then by some, you know you apply the snowball principle to, to to look further and deeper. The, the the three lists that I mentioned in terms of like that have non indicative non exhaustive lists are in the Q and A also specified. Um, so that's a good start to to to, um, to to assess the context where you might be worried about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, we have in the chat as well, Christoph Marco, who wanted to make a remark and ask a question. Christoph. Thank you. I wanted to uh, look especially at um, the issue of uh, responsible disengagement uh, within uh, heightened due diligence. So um, I think that's also one way to reduce the number of, of countries to look at. Um, to look at how many, what are the countries that are currently considered for responsible disengagement uh, based on uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives. Uh, according to my knowledge, uh, it's, uh, you have um, Myanmar, uh, you have uh, the region of Xinjiang in China, and uh, there is Russia and, and Belarus uh, that are in, in discussions at the moment. So that's about uh, responsible disengagement. And I think as you said it during the, the presentation, um, it's, um, there is the option to stay. It's not uh, about, it's not only that you have to go, it's, there is the option to stay. Uh, but I think you have to go a bit in more details there because um, if you look, for example, at uh, what Yale University has been developing, they have a full um, 
a broader uh, terminology and, and, and more categories than just two of them. So uh, one of the categories is just business as usual, you continue. Uh, they don't like it. And then the second category is you, you do just a symbolic reduction of your activities, like you stop new investments or you stop your marketing. Uh, that's the second option. And option number three is, is really to start to scaling back activities. So you're not leaving the country, but you are, you are reducing your activities, uh, focusing maybe on essential goods, as you said. Um, but you also you have to stop uh, activities linked to state enterprises. Uh, that's not according to the UN guidance and, and we see this. So that's also something um, to consider. Uh, I've been looking at the list of, of um, Yale University and, and what are the Swiss companies that are um, categorized in, in category um, uh, business as usual, num category F, or uh, categories as, as gaining time, so not really just doing some symbolic reduction. Uh, it's interesting that so most of those companies are not members of the U UN Global Compact of Switzerland. So um, um, that's a good occasion to to um, say thank you to the, for the UN Global Compact Switzerland to organize such a the conference as today, but uh, we, we still have the question, so what do we do with those other companies uh, like Barry Kallenbaut and Swiss Kronos and Liebherr? Uh, they are not, as I said, not part of the UN Global Compact Switzerland and um, uh, at the moment they have a bad uh, rating according to this uh, data from uh, Yale University. So for me, it's also you know, and a question of, of how uh, the whole communication is, is happening um, based on those responsible disengagement uh, decisions. Uh, according to the UN guidelines, principle 21, you are supposed to communicate actively, um, you explain your decisions to stay engaged in a country. Uh, you are supposed to, to, to report about that frequently. And this information must be accessible to the audience. Um, and at the moment, I don't know if there is enough of that. Um, there are some communications going on, but I don't know if it's enough. Um, so I know it's some difficult questions. Uh, so if some of the people want to touch them, uh, but I, if, if it's not a good occasion to, yeah, to maybe I can respond just... now, it's OK. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. For the for the intervention, maybe just one reflection to add on top of that. So of course, yeah, um, I mean, communication is a very important part of due diligence and especially of also heightened due diligence. Um, I think what's important is also to remember that due diligence does not require you to necessarily leave, right? It requires you to identify the risk and address the risk and take measures to make it better. So is there if there is a way? for a company to stay in a complex environment. And of course it does not, as we heard before, it's really a case to case analysis. It does not apply equally to all of them. Um, but, but the goal is really to, to be a force for good, to minimize negative impacts and, and to maybe even contribute to the, to the situation improving. And, and so the, the responsible exit is really a last resort when, when the company evaluates that there is no way of staying and, and actually, you know, be, be responsible at the same time. I don't know, Evelyn, if you want to compliment on that. Well, yeah, no, I really appreciate the differentiation here. The sort of leave or stay are the two extremes now and in between the shades of shades of gray and the work that the Yale University has done is basically try to differentiate there because of course you could sort of exit somewhat or not reinvest and not scale your business as you might have intended at some point in Myanmar, whichever context it is, but to, to take a more phased approach there. And, and um, uh, but, but as you were saying, also, it's about, uh, it's about how you explain yourself and how you uh, communicate your decision and make that 
make that open somewhat to scrutiny. Now, of course, we have the problem that uh, in an ideal world through multi-stakeholder initiatives such as the UN Global Pon Compact uh, and the comprehensiveness of such uh, um, multi-stakeholder initiatives, you're, you're crowding companies to to work along similar lines, but uh, because it's voluntary, I guess that's why we are seeing more legislative and regulatory uh, requirements to be required to do this sort of due diligence assessment and to do heightened human rights due diligence assessment. Because at the very late, at very least, once you've done that, you can't say that you had you didn't know, no. And it requires it, it forces or in it enforces that companies look at it in a in a system in a somewhat systematic way and and uh, and have to explain themselves more than perhaps just be quiet about what their Im implicit decision is and um, and and to continue but um, i guess there the opinions are very there too to you know in to what extent the multi stakeholder voluntary initiatives drive this uh, and to what extent legal and regulatory requirements are coming in because somewhat they see that as not as not being sufficient no um, but yes, I mean, it's important to stress that undertaking a heightened human rights due diligence assessment doesn't mean that a decision comes, you know, that that, that means you have to leave. I mean, it, it means that you have to, uh, that you have to argue and explain to yourself and to others what you, what you decide to do. Thank you very much. It's very interesting discussions. Um, we have another question and we would need also to, to go on with the other presentation. So Regula, Evelyn, I will ask the question and if you could give a, a short answer and, and maybe you, you can have more information, share more information in a bilateral way. Um, so it's a question from Matteo Agustoni uh, regarding when deciding on uh, staying or leaving a conflict affected area, but the question of maybe another company will jump into what we were doing and have even a more negative impact as we do have. So how to decide um, if, if leaving or, or staying um, in this kind of, of situation? Well, <laughs> It's a difficult question in one way because it's an easy argument to make if we leave somebody worse will come. So I think the 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 I guess what you would expect if somebody makes that argument is to say why you are better and what are you trying how are you trying to manage the situation better than somebody else because it doesn't mean staying that you that you operate in the same way as you might have been able before. It might well be that you test a bit more what level of influence and what leverage you actually have to contribute to a, the situation being not as worse as it could be or to try to signal the disapprovement and, and, and I guess play somewhat on your on the dependence that that the respective authorities um, may have on you. So I think just to say, well, somebody else might has to be substantiated then both on the side what you can what you can do positively better than others, but also how real this risk is. And, you know, and I think from a reputational and corporate, you know, a, 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 um, corporate culture perspective, that's another that's another aspect that comes into you. You know, you, you might want to leave also for internal reasons and for um, reasons that have to do with reputation and take it as a lesser argument that somebody else might come in and take your business because of the way that you don't want to do business. That's a normative stance then. Yeah. Thank you very much, Evelyn. That was very helpful. Now, I would like to invite um, Charlie Main from uh, VSC Security Services. He's the CEO and co-founder. And um, Charlie, are you sharing slides, I think? Yeah, I will do. Yes, yeah. sure. Yeah. And so thank you, Charlie. We'll be speaking about responsible security in a complex environment. Um, can you share your slides? Is it? Yes, great. Hopefully we can all see that. Yeah. Not yet. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Great. So, um, very brief inter introduction um, of me. Um, started working in Iraq in 2005 and founded VSC with a couple of other partners in 2006. So um, I've sort of seen the country go through a number of different levels of, of complexity um, and security, if you like, the security environment. Um, none of it 
incredibly good. It's always remain, remained complex. It's always remained comp, uh, complicated. But I'm going to talk today mostly about the perspective of providing security in these types of areas. Um, what I would like to say, though, is that it's a fascinating uh, the stop go question for companies, right? Um, and I'm not going to dive into this in great detail. I do cover it a little bit further on in my presentation, but um, I do have, I think, not unique because every security company with a broad range of companies and different sectors and, and of different sizes has seen, you know, um, the way that different companies can approach uh, a go no go uh, decision. So we've been through a number of iterations where uh, some clients have gone. And some have stayed um, and some of them have done that for, for various different reasons. And we also see um, a really incredible, sometimes slightly uncomfortable uh, spectrum of approaches to due, due diligence and particularly around the due diligence that companies will undertake around the potential for human rights abuses. So I'm not going to go into a massive amount of depth on that today. But um, you'll see my contact details at the end. They'll be in the slides and they come out. And anybody who would like to either ask questions at the end or take that further um, at a later date, then please do feel free to get in touch with me. So um, <clears throat> how do you know when you're in a complex environment, right? So we have talked about this a little. Um, Evelyn talked on it, but there's some obvious stuff. You know, is terrorism ongoing? Is there an active insurgency um, you know, are there combat operations um, going around around you, whether that be in adjoining countries or in different regions of a country? You know, these are the sort of obvious things that people think about very quickly. But also, um, there can also be uh, split regimes. That's obviously often uh, a good indicator that something could happen, that there could be conflict. Um, there can be autonomous regions. There can be different um, authorities involved. We've seen, we see that pretty regularly in Iraq. We've seen it in Libya on an ongoing basis, and we saw it recently in Sudan. Also, um, if there are low levels of, of democracy, which can lead to real issues around elections, a highly authoritarian regime, um, if you're dealing with uh, governmental security forces, can also be something of a red flag that you may want to think about it as a complex environment. Very high levels of corruption, or um, high levels of tribalism. And that is, is something that is constantly at the forefront of what we do in Iraq. And it's a very, um, can certainly be in certain regions, a very uh, tribal uh, area where they actually actively fight together. Um, and so those are the sort of things that you should be thinking about when you're going into, into um, a context or an operating environment. But it's also important to consider how you're connected to that operating environment. So the way that people in, um, approach risk management and how they engage with communities and how they engage with security agencies differs really quite, quite dramatically between those who provide service and those who are actually responsible for the operations within the area where, where, where they're operating. So how embedded are you in a community? I mean, I think that's extremely important when you're thinking about how you manage risk or whether or not you should be enhancing your due diligence. And I would suggest if you're the operating company, you should take or on the side of caution and take the enhanced due diligence route. Um, and what this does is by thinking hard about how you're analyzing your environment and should you should you be going down the, um, the enhanced due diligence route is it does help understanding your planning, understanding what you're getting into, understanding what could happen next. And the... The upside of that is that it helps you to manage your risk at the same time. And also something that, that over the years I've experienced is that when working with different companies, there are those who view the external environment as something that they should protect themselves from, that they should minimize their contact with. And there are those who think that getting out there, opening um, lines of communication, building bridges rather than constructing walls um, and engaging with stakeholders can help them monitor their situation and find out about issues before they arise. And in my experience as a security company, I can cope with both approaches, but I absolutely definitively prefer to build a bridge, talk to your stakeholders, increase the size of the pie and increase the size of, you know, the, the places where you're getting your information from. So um, when you're talking about security, and the potential for human rights risks in complex environments. At the point where you decide you need a security company, 
you're in an enhanced um, due diligence situation, right? And, and by using security, um, I won't pretend that you're not increasing your risk for human rights abuses, okay? They, they are there, they're extant when you get there and it's a complex environment. But by deciding that you need a security provider, you need to be thinking about how that increases the potential for those human rights risks, how building walls or the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis may lead to, to, to um, secondary or tertiary um, impacts, right? It's not just about, okay, we've got an asset there, let's build this fence, let's put up this guard post, let's arm our guards, let's have this access control mechanism. So what does that all do to the communities and stakeholders around you, right? It's You're not operating in a vacuum. It's not just about looking after your assets and, um, and your people. It's also about trying to protect the communities that you're working around. And that's really, if you like, what um, responsible security is about. So many, you know, that's a little unfair possibly, but there are certainly security providers who simply think about security, okay? It, it, you know, if they're allowed to, they'll give people guns, they'll give them armored vehicles, they'll tell you you need to move in a, you know, a, a three vehicle um, convoy, you know, and that absolutely can be right for certain environments, you know, and, and I'd say that particularly for governmental clients, that's often the way that, that they have to go simply because of the level of risk and their level of um, and their very high profile and the sort of um, potential things that can happen and the reputational risk, et cetera. But you can do any type of security responsibly. And that, in, in essence, is about thinking about what impact each thing you do will have on the people around you, not just your own people. Um, so if you like, what I'm saying is, is it's, it's never advisable, it'll never help you in the long term to take the navel gazing approach to your security. Um, and, and a good example can be, you know, as you build a perimeter or you, you give your guards or your security company the right or the instruction that this is an area that people can't enter, are you aware of the grazing rights? Do you know how people are moving from one area to another, whether that be a large town or a, or a village? Are there traditional access rights that you need to be considering? And if you haven't considered those, have you considered the fact that by empowering your security company to secure that area, you're potentially simply asking for something like an unlawful detention, an assault. You're potentially creating a, a power imbalance where a guard could, could you know, take bribes, could use extortion to allow people to enter those areas without telling, telling the company, et cetera. So it's about thinking about what are all the ramifications going forward. So what are the, the business advantages of responsible security, if you like? For me, I think the key one is, is building those bridges without exposing your company and your operations to additional risk, right? So we, in some ways, Iraq is a good place to provide security because more often than not, it's possible to get well-vetted personnel from local communities. Um, and what that allows you to do is engage very early with the local authorities, with the, um, with the security agencies, and ensure that they have contacts within the company. And through the security company, you can then um, ensure that as an issue becomes an issue, you're hearing about it, right? It's an open dialogue. People may go to the local police or the you know, the local intelligence agency and alert them to a problem, but rather than them all sitting around working out, you know, how they're going to get back at you, they just pick up the phone or send you an email, you know. And so quite often we find that the issues around, you know, whether it be water access or, you know, pollution or, or something like that, you very quickly get to the table where it can actually be sorted out before it becomes something where the security that you've put around the asset or around the personnel of the company are actually then under threat. You're solving issues at the table. Um, I guess a, a phrase I quite often like to use is that, you know, good neighbors make for good security. Um, so, and, and through that, through employment and through discussion and through engaging a very broad range of stakeholders, um, you do have the opportunity through your security provider, and, and this isn't something you should delegate to your security provider, right? It should be owned by the operating company. It should be a partnership. It should be very carefully managed step by step. 
at each level of, of interaction. But you do have the, operation, uh, the opportunity to not just do no harm, but to potentially actually do some good, you know, to create um, a trust with communities, to create an understanding of how things are operating, to create an understanding of why you feel you need security. You know, a problem that, that was run into right at the very start of operations in Iraq was that communities often felt like they were being protected from, from the communities, right? So there was this big operating company, they're coming into, you know, taking over land, et cetera. And there was a feeling within the communities that they saw them as a threat. And so by engaging communities and saying, no, it's not you that is the threat, you know, it's the insurgents. I mean, have you seen the security environment? You know, it's about ensuring that people can see each other's perspectives. Um, so conflict sensitive or responsible security, right? It, it's not about, um, you know, setting aside the safety of personnel or the safety of your locations, right? That is, that is absolutely fundamental to ensuring in a complex environment that people can continue to operate, you know, but it is about doing it responsibly. Always thinking, if I do this, what might happen next? And by doing that, you, you're greatly increasing the chances that you'll recognize escalating risks, you know, and th that's key to staying, right? And any company who's done a large investment, any company that launches into, into a country, it's never for free. So, you know, cor you know corporations, companies, um, you know, media, they're there for the reason that ultimately they're a business. And so recognizing the risk to that business and put and trying to avoid getting into a situation where they have to leave, which is, you know, from a business perspective, an investor's perspective, that's an Armageddon scenario, right? You, you just have to pack up and leave, leave everything behind. So trying to avoid that is a good thing to do. And seeing increased risk, trying to make sure you're mitigating it sensibly and trying to trying to get to the fundamental underlying reasons for it is always a good thing to be able to do. So when you talk about enhanced due diligence, I'll talk it's about it specifically um, and pretty quickly uh, from a security company perspective. So leadership within a security company is absolutely vital to getting what you think is written on the can, right? So, you know, you can write a fabulous contract that talks about ICOCA and ISO 18788 and enhanced due diligence, and you have to do this and you have to do that. You can't detain people interaction with local with, with governments, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But if if the security company leadership isn't genuinely committed to it, then you won't get it. You know, and that's really where certification matters. So particularly if you're a smaller company, it, it can be very wise to look at companies that are thinking about certification who are moving towards certification or at least aware of certification. But it also requires some levels of pragmatism. So there are many areas in the world where you simply don't have access to internationally certified companies. And so by going in and talking to companies, hopefully at CEO level, but at a, I would advise at a minimum of the person who holds the reins of compliance um, within the company, you, you can really start to get under the skin of, of what that company really thinks and how they operate. And I advise that at the point where you're doing this with security companies, it can be unwise to believe that because you're an expert in, you know, uh, mining or, or oil or, or news, you know, generating news that you know about security and you know about your environment. You know, the chances that you will understand the complex environment are extremely low. So I would advise that utilizing some form of, you know, external stakeholders or, advise, or advisors during your, your procurement procedure for your security company is something that pays dividends in the end, you know. Um, so when to stay and when to go. So this is kind of a cliched bit, the first point, the knowns, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. But what I want to talk about is the importance of getting as much information as you possibly can, you know, and taking that from external sources. Um, and using advice from other people, but also being very, very aware that burying yourself on, under information is not actually um, expanding your knowledge. So you've got to take all your information feeds. You've got to talk to all your external advisors, stakeholders, your security companies, your service providers. 
You've got to put that together in a way that generates some knowledge. And then you need to make sure that as you generate that knowledge, you're actually using it to inform your next operational move, your next decision, that you're not, again, within the company taking your decisions in a sort of ring-fenced way. Okay, this next step is good for us operationally, so we should do that. Okay, think about, um, you know, take it sort of holistically. Involve the information you're getting. Look at the risks, how they're managed. What are the impacts to the risks? And what this really allows you to do is take all the information and knowledge you know, and companies often spend a lot of money on informing themselves about the geopolitical situation. But from my experience, there are actually very few companies who spend much time thinking, OK, this is the geopolitical situation. Here are the scenarios that we believe could happen. So how do we minimize disruption and maximize um, opportunity and adva advantage for for our operations for us as a business unit and when you do that you begin to 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 ensure that as you do things you're doing it in a joined up fashion you're thinking about the possible ramifications if necessary you may want to put in heightened security measure, measures to further mitigate risks you think may be happening if you think it could be you know a, a, a group that you have no control over whether that be an insurgency or a local militia or something but you know, it's about it's about understanding the environment and actually utilizing that. So putting it all together in a holistic way, and also looking for the unknown unknowns. In my experience to date, there hasn't been a leave decision made that didn't involve some element of something nobody had thought about. You know, and whether that's a dramatic collapse of the security forces or it's you, you know a, a a pollution, what one piece of um. Uh, one operation that does one too many pieces of pollution and, and an external group come in and just say, okay, you know, attack a camp, for instance, and then you 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 put your position because you have to leave because you haven't built the bridges, you don't have the ability to resolve it, and you just haven't thought of it. Again, external stakeholders and advisors can be a can be very useful, but just to um just from a security perspective, and I'm I'm big into companies you know, to understand that as you go through the process of operations, don't be dazzled by opportunities. So the oil and commodities industry is a very good example, right? So as the price of something goes up, we often see companies who will come to us and say, okay, you know that high risk area that we thought was high risk? Well, we think it's much lower risk now. So we think we're going to go in there and exploit it. Can you secure it? And so we we will you know we will attempt to secure operations in a lot of places but we're sensible enough and responsible enough to tell a company when it's not a good idea but my point is that because of the reward of an opportunity increases the risk of doing it does not decrease so i just say to companies as they're making plans to do things you know and potentially you know the reward is increasing that is not decreasing your risk and, and be sensible and know that and, and pragmatic about it and honest with your security provider. So um, I'm basically out of time. So there's my contact details. Hopefully some people have some questions and answers and that was kind of useful. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you so much for, for these very practical insights and, uh, and recommendations on these very complex issues. Um, now, I haven't seen questions directly in the chat, and for the sake of time, I think we will go on with the interview. Um, Regula and Jamie Williamson, I invite you to start your interview. Thank you so much, Alice, and thank you also, Jamie Williamson, uh, that you're part today of this webinar to let us know a bit more about what the role is of the International Code of Conduct for private security providers and how companies can can make use of this. So could you give us maybe a quick overview of what is ICOCA and how can it support companies? Thank you, Regula. And thank you to the uh, the first few speakers. It's been fascinating for the past hour thereabouts to hear about enhanced human rights to digits. I think in many ways, um, the way to answer the question about ICOCA, it's an organization which was established exactly to do with the issues that have been raised in this particular webinar. It's a multi-stakeholder organization established about 10 years ago under the leadership of the Swiss government. 
that brings together security companies, about 120, 130 are present, civil society organizations, governments, as well as multinational corporations, to make sure that security companies, private security companies, uh, such as the one uh, that Charlie represents, uh, operate to the highest international standards, apply human rights, and are being held accountable for any potential abuses. And working closely with the companies that actually use those security companies, making sure that we're helping them with their human rights due diligence uh, within their supply chains. And what are the typical companies that would use security uh, providers? I think effectively any sector uh, would be using private security these days. Uh, naturally, when you're in the more high risk environments, uh, those companies are, are unable to extract themselves. You're looking at the excuse upon the extractive industry, those working on uh, natural resources. But if effectively, any company operating in an environment where there's a risk and which uses uh, private security could potentially be a company that uh, is interested in working with ICOCA as part of that oversight of their security providers. And the, let's say, sectors would go from the extractive industry, retail, agribusiness, humanitarian agencies, governments, the media, sporting foundations, et cetera. So you can have any number of entities out there would use security wherever there's a risk, and they all have the same kind of obligations. We heard um, a couple of examples already on why um, responsible security um, is important. Can you give us a few more concrete examples of which human rights risks might arise when companies make use of these private security providers? Thanks, Vigida. Um The cases I'm going to refer to are publicly sourced cases. And I think for those out there in terms of the multinational corporations or any entities that you referred to at the beginning of this presentation, where you have an extensive uh, value chain as such, uh, would be uh, interested in these kind of cases. And the impacts are not simply human rights. I think you need to look at the financial and reputational piece as well, because that often gets the companies talking, less the human rights abuses. To give you four quick examples across different sectors, um, Camellia UK, uh, a parent company, with its subsidiary operating out of Kenya, avocado plantations, and security guards supposedly abusing, uh, torture, beatings, and others, plantation workers and local community workers. Lawsuits filed against them in UK jurisdictions. They settled out of court for about 4.6 million, but there was a major reputational hit, as well as avocados taken off the supermarkets. Uh, the extractive industry, presently public sourced, Barrett Gold uh, International and the Mara Mines uh, Northern Kenya, three lawsuits pending against them for the same kind of allegations vis-a-vis -vis their security companies. Carrefour um, Retail, Brazil, a couple of years ago, footage of two of their security guards beating to death a local uh, Brazilian. Massive hit, of course, human rights abuse, murder or uh, manslaughter or killing at the very least, but from a reputational piece, uh, Carrefour had a 5% drop in their share value and had nearly $400 million wiped off their share price overnight. In Qatar, here we're looking more about the use of migrant workers. So we have supply chains and we have a workforce that companies need to look at who's being hired. And in Qatar, there were major scandals vis-a-vis -vis the hiring of migrant workers and potential modern slavery issues for the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup. Human rights abuse vis-a-vis -vis the guards themselves, less about how the guards are treating local communities. Those will be like four key cases. I can give you many others, but I know we don't have a huge amount of time. Yeah. But to say that effectively, you have the human rights abuses, you have the uh, protections of the guards themselves, you have the hit for the companies that are hiring or subcontracting those companies. Last but not least on those points, except for one of these cases, all the others, there was very little information about the private security company itself. The impact was on the client, on the company actually using the security provider. That's who was sued, and those were the ones whose reputation suffered the most. That's a very interesting point, and it's also relevant, of course, from a human rights due diligence perspective. So then what are the measures? What can the, what can the companies that use these uh, security providers, what can they do to kind of prevent these human rights risks from occurring? What are the measures? There's plenty, and maybe I'm going to build on Charlie Main's uh, few comments uh, a couple of minutes ago. I think the company, the, the baseline has to be the company needs to have assurance in the private security provider that it's using. So they have to know that private security company. They have to understand how they operate. 
They have to be cognizant of the leadership and culture within that company. And they have to monitor and ensure that that company is held accountable if something goes wrong in terms of their security provider. Give you four kind of broad examples. So we have multinational corporations that have joined ICOCA as observers because they have a genuine interest in making sure that their security providers meet international standards. And those very same multinational corporations want to ensure that they meet the heightened or enhanced human rights due diligence requirements. So one uh, multinational corporation and a few others out there, they simply made it a requirement for all of their private security providers within their supply chain to join the association. As simple as that. That's a level of assurance, of training, of capacity, of selection and vetting checks. That they can, to some extent, rely on ICOCA uh, to provide that kind of support, but they make sure they have that uh, second pair of eyes out there, outside of them, looking at their security providers. Uh, some multinational corporations have invited ICOCA to go on site as they were selecting their security, security providers to make an assessment of what that security provider looks like locally and to then give the feedback, not as an audit, but to give a human rights feedback to the uh, client company before they selected their security provider. Other uh, multinational corporations have actually come to us when one of their security providers have potentially been in violation of the International Code of Conduct to assess whether or not that security company was in violation of the code, what remedial action has been taken, and then ensuring that that company ultimately remains in compliance with the code. And last piece, which is an interesting one, security providers that uh, work, work or join ICOCA also have an upstream obligation. In other words, they are not allowed to take contracts where the parent company or the client company have been uh, uh, where there's allegations of human rights abuses against that client company. So you can actually have a positive effect upstream from the companies like Charlie Mains in uh, Iraq, where they will tell the multinational corporation, these are the human rights issues you need to look at. There are question marks about your own policies, and we want those fixed before we will take a contract with you. I think that's an Im important point of how due diligence goes both ways, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both be between the client uh, and, and the service provider. So for companies that are really just starting with these topics, what would you say is kind of the first step for a company that is starting to look into that issue of responsible security providers? And if by company we're talking about any potential corporation that's going to be working in an environment where there's a need for enhanced human rights due diligence, the first is a purely self-serving one. I would recommend that those companies join ICOCA as observers and actually engage with an organization that has been established by governments and others to do that, to look at human rights due diligence within supply chains where you have security providers. Absent that, the companies, and this builds on Charlie's point earlier, have to know which security providers are in their supply chains. They have to understand uh, the structures of the security companies, the selection and vetting, the kind of training that they carried out, test them in terms of the training. Don't be satisfied with a couple of PowerPoint slides ticking the box in terms of, of training. From an IHL perspective, and you've all covered these points, the conflict analysis and conflict dynamics is critical, especially when you spill over into the IHL world. So we were speaking with private security companies recently operating in Ukraine. And their question marks were, we've been asked by a client to do A, B, and C. Does that endanger us from an IHL perspective? And we gave advice in terms of what that would mean potentially and then being complicit in anything in, um, in Ukraine and then participating in hostilities. That kind of reflection needs to be had also by the uh, companies, the multinationals, and they need to turn to the experts on that. They can turn to ICOCA or other organizations to have that kind of legal assessment in terms of what happens if we get involved in such a way or if we stay in that particular context. The second point I would say in terms of the very operational and the getting to know your company, understanding where the security providers get their staff from is particularly important, especially if you have a range of non-state armed actors operating there. Because in many environments, the non-state armed groups will simply reform and become a private security company as well. And the question for the client is, can they trust and do they see that company operating to the highest levels? Thank you, Jamie. Maybe with regards to time, um, I think we wrap up here. We have a little bit more time. Uh, I think all of our speakers to stay on a bit longer in case there's some additional questions coming up. And if not, I just want to point you towards some uh, additional resources that are available 
um, for you if you want to read up a little bit more um, about the topic. So if you're interested, we didn't really touch upon kind of the basic human rights due diligence process so much in this webinar, but of course, this is kind of the basis from which you would take uh, due diligence to the next level. So if you're interested to kind of have a look of what that means exactly, there is a, a guide available online um, in four languages. Um, so it should be something there for everybody. There is also uh, recordings of webinars that we did also uh, in English, French, German, uh, and Italian. And if you want to know more about heightened uh, human rights due diligence, um, there is also very interesting and relevant guidance available that were mentioned at the beginning. So there is this heightened human rights due diligence guide for business in conflict affected contests by the uh, UNDP. And there is also the security and human rights knowledge hub that was also posted by Claude uh, from the ICRC in the chat earlier. So these are a lot of really, really good resources available where you can have a look at in quite a lot of details. And there is a lot of guidance um, available that, that I can recommend. Um, maybe the last uh, comment from my side, um, it would be great if you could participate in a really short evaluation survey of this webinar. So maybe you can have uh, you can give us some feedback of what you liked about today's webinar and what do you think we could uh, do better next time. And would also from my side, a, a big thank you to all of the speakers uh, who contributed to this webinar. It's really great um, to have, have you on this uh, webinar and I will hand over back to Alice. Thank you so much. Thank you to every speaker and also to the audience for, for the questions and for the great inputs. Um, so just that the, the evaluation survey is in the chat. If you have time to answer it now, um, you can do it now. Otherwise, we will send it anyway per email as well. So um, I think I haven't seen any further questions in the chat, but or regular have you seen something not not no. until now okay um so if um if you have a question uh coming in your mind in the upcoming hours or days um you can uh write us an email at uh, info at globalcompact.ch we will make sure to make the link uh with the relevant speakers and um, yes, otherwise, uh, I think we can close now. I would like to thank really all of you. That was extremely insightful and uh, wish you all a very nice afternoon. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>